My name is Timo Rova. I'm uh, the West Zone FMO, which is Fire Management Officer. I, uh, the West Zone is the Ely Kwishwe office, the Aurora Laurentian, and the Cook LaCroix offices. It uh, encompasses the western two-thirds of the Superior National Forest in the wilderness. Uh, I'm a native Minnesotan. I lived away for over two decades working for the Forest Service out west, but I'm back and my family's from Ely. When they came over from Finland, this is where they came, homesteaded, worked the mines, the logging camps, the co-ops, all of that. And so I have a history here and uh, this is where I live now is within about five miles of where we stand right now. Right now we're on Burnside Lake. We're on a bay called School Section Bay. It's Section 16, a school section, a state owned. And we're right now coming off of that onto Section 17, which is Forest Service owned on the west shore of Burnside Lake, just below the North Arm uh, Channel, where Camp Widgee and Denord are, and just north of the Portage to Crab Lake into the wilderness. The wilderness is a little over a quarter of a mile to our west. Well, our stems per acre, the density of trees has gone way up. And so there's been more shading. And with more shading and encroachment into our blueberry meadows, which are bigger and more sunny, uh, we've got an encroachment with uh, mainly balsam. Without fire, it had, it had encroached in a lot of these openings. And under, in the understory of the bigger pine, it was coming up and would have been a ladder fuel that when it burned, it would have carried it up into the canopy of the, the super pine and the, the old story pine, the seed source for the future. And um, a lot of shading, a lot of diversity was lost with uh, the absence of fire. Blueberries were not producing blueberries. They were going dormant. They need fire to prune them. Uh, we had a lot of maple coming in and uh, that's a global change species too. So that was coming in and we were losing our, our birch. We didn't have much or any new birch coming up and, uh, and we were losing our jack pine also. In some areas we've lost it. Our forest plan, you know, fire is a natural agent of change on all the forest. But in the wilderness, it's uh, one of the main ones we have, and we have it written in there, written in the forest plan that we can use fire and manage it. We don't let it go. We don't let it burn. We manage a fire with a plan to act like a fire historically would. Uh, so if we get a lightning strike in the wilderness and the timing's right, we can get permission to allow that fire to burn. And we set up a box, like we'd like to allow it to have a chance to grow out to these lakes, this river, these natural boundaries, we call them. And now under our current um, policy, we can even go in and do some manipulation, like on a portage or something to help hold it there. In the past, we couldn't. Now we can we can manage the fire and do a little bit of work in certain areas to use reinforce the natural boundary or a portage to to limit the growth to a certain area. But the the big problem with managing fire in the wilderness is when the fire comes out of the wilderness. And in this area, people have developed on their private land a lot of infrastructure right on the edge of the wilderness. And this treatment is right on the eastern edge of the trout unit of the wilderness, of the Boundary Waters Wilderness Canoe Area. So by doing this treatment, the hope is it will give us some ground to work from, some areas and acres that are treated right on the edge of the wilderness to help us deal with a fire that's coming to come out of the wilderness and impact private lands. And... Uh, Thus, it's for public safety, so we can manage fires in the wilderness in the future 
and get that back more in a natural functioning ecosystem. So one of the objectives of the reintroduction of fire on this part of Burnside Lake and hopefully to a greater part of the Superior Forest is that uh, we can keep it a fire dependent ecosystem. With the uh, suppression we had for over a hundred years, balsam encroached and came in, was ubiquitous across this whole landscape. There was very little area without balsam. And then we have the spruce budworm come in and kill it. And it's very susceptible to fire. And um, there was no mosaic. There was no break in that. It was all a decadent forest with a lot of dead and dying balsam very heavily stocked, which is a firefighter's nightmare. It also isn't how this forest in this area had ever been in the past. There had been frequent fly fires that kept it more of a mosaic and different age classes and broke up the density and the availability of the balsam. And this area here was burnt the first time in mid-June of 2015. It was reburned last year, 2019, in late May. So this area has been burned twice. Uh, when we first burned it, we, we went on a wetter, a cooler end of the prescription. Prescription is what allows us to burn. We are within certain parameters and we, we put those out for the public and other folks to know what they are. And we wait for the weather and the fuels to be within that prescription. After our first burn, we could burn it hotter because we had taken the flash, the, um, the flashiness of the balsam and that mostly out of the burn. So the second time we burned it, just last year in 2019, we burned it under a hotter prescription. And with that, we were able to get some consumption of the heavies, of the soils, and the fire carried into areas it hadn't the first time because they were more available to burn. The first time that we burned it, before we did that, we did some mechanical work, hand treatment, timber stand improvement, we call TSI. And in that area, we didn't have enough money to do all of it, so we went in using a tool LIDAR, we call LIDAR, and um, we found these stands of pine. And, and um, we built polygons, which are like closed units, and we, we made them the size of the money we had to do treatment. So they, we were given so much money from the regional office and the WO, Washington office, to do this project, and we were, figured out how much it was going to cost per acre to have crews come in and cut this and TSI it. And so we made them, and we... we we concentrated on the stands of pine, thinking that's what we wanted to protect the most. And so they came in, they cut all balsam six inches or four inches and smaller, and cut it four feet or less, cut ma young maple and uh, any di dead or dying birch, laid it on the ground, and when it was under the pines, they pulled it away from the boles of the trees to try minimizing um, severity of the burn in the pine stands. This is an area that shows the mixed severity of burn. It shows some more severeness even. Uh, we killed some of the big white and red pine. Uh, all the birch is dead, but if you look at the stump of every birch, there's new baby birch coming up. And they're coming up. We're going to have a whole new crop and the mineral soil has been opened up, they'll within a few years be able to seed in. We're going to see a lot more birch, which we've been losing. Um, we killed some of the pine, and that does alarm people, but what people may not realize in our thick forests, like we're going to see later on, a lot of these pine are dying and falling over. We just don't see it. The brush is so thick, and there's so much balsam. Well, here, they died standing, they're fire hardened. Some of them are gonna stay standing for a long time and that's great for a wildlife tree, for bald eagle, osprey, and all sorts of uh, birds. This is what we need. But you can see a lot of them made it. A lot of very beautiful ones made it. 
they're going to help seed in and start a new crop. And we have some, a lot of diversity here. We have a few aspen, we have birch, we have it open, we have some maple stump sprouting and coming up. We're getting young white and red pine coming in here and we have a lot of blueberry. And this is going to change and if we could burn it again in like 20 to 30 years once the pine, like the ones over here, you can see these young pine over here that are about 15 years old, they made it through this prescribed fire where other things didn't. Pine can handle fire very, very well. So if we could burn it in 20 to 30 years again, a lot of the pine that would be coming up would make it. Some wouldn't, and that's great. That keeps openings and patchiness and mosaic. But um, this is really going to help, and it's, it's quite open. We can, we can get a breeze through here. It's not stifled and choked. And uh, this is what we want. And it may look severe to people, but it really isn't. Severe to a lot of us is all the dead, thick balsam. We were looking for a good project. Uh, we hadn't been burning on the west zone for quite a while. We had just come out of the Pagami burn, the Pagami fire which showed that uh, managing fires is tough, but it also showed us that fires want to burn big in this country, especially with uh, 100 plus years of suppression. We have the ham, the cavity, Sag Corridor, um, the Gabros, the Pagami. We have uh, the White Feather. All these fires and more, there's the Little Indian Sioux, where we see that fires want to go big quick. The area goes from not able to hardly burn at all to being able to sustain large fire pretty quickly. Uh, we can go from the lowest indices to very high in seven days and to extreme in like 12 to 13 days. That's, that's less than two weeks from sopping wet to having fire, campfire restrictions and, and that kind of stuff. So especially with all the balsam, we're really susceptible. Um, having not done much prescribed burn for a while, we had been doing quite a bit after the blowdown, but had kind of fallen out of it. Uh, we needed to get back into it. And we're looking at this area, we had just had a fire in the wilderness and when I first got here in late 2012, and the smoke was laying right over in this area, and people were concerned about it. And for a fire in the wilderness to come out, or to be managed in there and feel a little more comfortable with it, I felt like this area along Burnside, a premier lake in northern Minnesota, would be a good candidate to focus our work as we rebuilt the program. We got confidence after some very big fires that kind of shook our confidence. And it was a good candidate because it was really protecting communities, uh, the communities on Burnside, but even the community itself of Ely, because that's not too far away. And these I came in, I also would walk around and I grew up on this lake, coming to this lake. My family's from here. Um, and I go with my grandpa and my dad and mom across the lake over to this side to go blueberry picking, to go hunting. And there weren't berries to pick anymore. There wasn't much game to shoot. It was hard to walk through the woods because there was just thick and tons of blowdown and deadfall. And um, it didn't have the big openings and the nice rocky ridges like I remembered as a kid and that my grandpa talked about. My grandpa said when he was young that the natives he knew would paddle along here and burn off the shorelines. And when, when they were asked why, they said the lake's called Burnside, you know. And so I grew up with these stories and, and, and hunting and gathering and just recreating uh, on this lake and in this area and up the Echo. And it had changed so much in my two plus decades out west that to me, I had a memory and when I came back it was so different. Maybe if you live here and it happens slowly, you don't realize it's changed that much. The Coo Lake area, we've been doing uh, mechanical treatment with TSI, which is timber stand improvement. Hand saw crews come in, they had to boat in here because this is a remote location and we pay them per acre to cut and lop and scatter, we call it this. Sometimes we have them hand cut and pile, and that's much more expensive. 
Um, sometimes we think, oh, it would be great to have hand cut and piled this, but if you see how much there is, you look in here, the slash is three to five feet deep across almost all of this unit. And this is 220 some acre unit. It butts right up to the wilderness. There's private property and county land with lease cabins on it right on the edge of it too. This is all balsam that was cut. It's been hit by spruce budworm. It was all gonna die. Our big challenge right now is how do we burn this and still keep something around? You know, how do we retain? Now there's a lot of jack pine that with it burning hot, we'll kill some of it, some we won't, but the cones will open up and this will be really good for reestablishing a jack pine stand in this area. It'll be predominantly jack pine and birch, I hope, because that's where it looks. Where up on some of the rocky knobs, we'll still retain some really good white and red pine that'll help seed in. Um, but you know, the question is, how do we burn this when there's so much fuel on the ground, what you see is everywhere out there except for on the top of the ridges. And it is thick and it's going to burn hot. We could wait three years, let the needles fall off and snow compact it, it might go better. We could burn it when it's really wet the first time and, uh, you know, fairly wet and then have to go back in two to three years later and burn it again to, to knock back the hardwood. But all that aside, when I put on the suppression part of my FMO hat, I breathe a sigh of relief because this stuff isn't standing up anymore. It's not up, carrying the fire up into the canopies. It's down on the ground and sure it'll burn hot, but our spotting issue is going to go far, far away. We could have some spotting, but uh, we aren't going to have nearly as much. It would be hard to put a fire out once it got well established in here, but we can back off and burn off the lake and the edge of the unit. So we've already done a lot in mitigating the fire hazard in this area by just knocking this balsam over. Um, so step one has been done and people can feel a little better about that. Once we get this stuff burned up, they can feel a lot better. When a fire would be coming from an untreated area, and hits this treatment area. And this is a large enough area that uh, just the size of it, 220 acres, gives it the depth and the breadth that it's a more resilient treatment. The fire is gonna go from running through the crowns and torching and spotting into this stuff. And this stuff since it's been laid down and cut, and even if it's been given nine months and a snow to compact it down, is gonna burn much less fast still burn hot but it won't be burning and moving as fast and it won't be spreading by spotting as much as if it was up standing so it's easier to fight it's easier to contain and our fire behavior is great And now the wilderness right over there can hopefully start having some more fires in it that we can manage and they can do it appropriately without taking off and running because we got this, this area ready to hold it. And if we get a gobbler in there, when it hits here, we have a good place that firefighters are safe to engage it from. And it, it, it builds an area that we can pick it up before it gets into the public's private owned land and places. So all in all, it's a really good strategy. Um, there are some hard parts and lighting the first matches after it hasn't had fire for a hundred years is, is a really tough thing to do. It's really tough to convince people to let you do it. And then day of and the day before is really tough. You don't sleep much the night before, but someone has to do it because it's not a question of if it's just a question of when is this going to burn. And this is very beautiful.